This record of man begins with the land at a time when it had no name. Islands which were no more than broken pieces of earth on the ever-changing face of the planet. A small corner in the vast uncharted regions of our world. The wind and rain shaped, molded, and transformed her surface. Land bridges linked this land to the great continent of Asia. The first settlers crossed these bridges on foot in search of game. With this primordial struggle for survival, the history of a people begins. Thousands of years later, the great layer of ice in the north broke in melting currents. The surging waters washed away these low-lying bridges, leaving only patches of land in the depths of an endless sea. Thus, the Philippines emerged, an archipelago, a cluster of more than 7,000 islands in the Pacific. Her landscape presents an awesome richness. These are our waters, rushing, spilling down mountainsides, winding their way to the plains, flowing into shoreless lakes, seat of culture and civilization, to serve the noblest of human aspirations, man's quest for immortality, expressed in the struggle for freedom, the creation of order, the search for wisdom, the worship of his God, and the liberation of his spirit. The pursuit of these ends gives meaning to human existence. Monuments rise to proclaim the achievements of man. At this point in time, the Philippines beckons to the world to invite the stranger to consider and recognize not a geographic expression, but a national identity. Confronting himself, tracing the wellsprings of his being, the Filipino search for identity is but a national aspect of the human crisis. And so, we peel off the mask and embark on our most perilous journey, plunging into the depths of ourselves. The forces of the earth have wrought their changes on the land. But today, the spirit of our people seek a new beginning in the unfinished story of a nation. Land and people witness the march of time, the rising landmarks of growth and progress. These times urge the Filipino to know himself, to rediscover his past and cultural beginnings to give life today to an art and architecture which shall live on for generations of Filipinos. The Folk Arts Theater of the Philippines, completed in 70 days, stands as an achievement of Philippine artistry and determination to house the rich and varied arts expressive of the soul of the Filipino people, to present what gives flesh to the wellsprings of a race, a monument to the Filipino spirit. Some 20,000 school children, university students, civil servants, workers and artists participated in a massive reenactment of their history as a million others came to watch the diverse elements of their story unfold.
occasion also coincided with the Miss Universe pageant which brought together beauty candidates from all over the world. The Filipino transformed the event into a people's pageant, a parade of the masses, an expression of the Filipino's irrepressible spirit, a celebration of the highest and noblest of national sentiments. International guests from neighboring countries and from Mexico, Spain, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the United States of America, Israel, Italy, and England came to grace the occasion. Among them, the Marquesa de Villaverde from Spain, Van Cliburn, pianist from the United States of America, Rufino Tamayo, painter from Mexico. This presentation focuses on the music, the costumes, the central episodes of history, and creates an impact which few history books can achieve. In an opening ceremony, generals of the Philippine army make a formal presentation to President Ferdinand Marcos. Fifty chieftains lead the pageant. As leaders of cultural minorities, they represent ethnic tribes who live all over the country. They are followed by the famed tribe of the Tassadais. These are descendants of the first Filipinos. Their tribal names suggest the strange and the unknown. But these tribes are a people with a culture truly alive with arts and crafts that testify to the wealth of ancient traditions of the country. From the provinces of the north, 
come the hardy mountain people known for their colorful costumes, their ingenious headdress, and their intricately woven clothes. They are brave warriors and masterful builders of the rice terraces of Mount Banawe, carved out of mountainsides 2,000 years ago. These rice terraces are known as the eighth wonder of the world. From the islands of Visayas, the Tagbanwas still live by the Kaingin method or slash and burn agriculture. But together with the Hanunuo tribe, they are among the most literate of cultural minorities and boast the use of an ancient syllabic system. It is in this region that the ancient manuscript called Maragdas was found. This manuscript throws some light on this land in pre-Spanish times. The Muslim tribes of the south are the greatest in number. Long before the arrival of Christian Spain, Islam had taken root in the great island of Mindanao and its offshore islands of Sulu. The Filipino Muslim has added to the richness of Philippine culture. But it is his resilience, a consistent posture of pride and courage, which sets him apart. The Maranaos call themselves people of the lake. Their highly sophisticated arts have made the area around Maranao Lake a center of Muslim culture. There are some 250,000 sea nomads who call themselves the Tausugs, or people of the current. They live in fluvial communities, mostly off the southern coasts of Mindanao. Basilan Island in the south, the Yakans live and are known for their rich weaving traditions and gay painted faces. While the Samals are ingenious builders of boats and like many other Filipinos, rely on the bounty of the sea for their livelihood. The government continually works to integrate these minorities who wish to join the mainstream of Filipino national life even as it protects the rights of those who prefer to remain and preserve their original way of life. These tribesmen number more than four million. Each tribe has something different to offer. The gentleness of manner, the charm of simplicity, the exuberance of arts and crafts, the unique dance forms, their ingenious instruments for music. But over and above these, their way of life exhibits that ageless wisdom, an understanding and observance of the timeless, unspoken laws of nature. All of these come together in a display of intense variety, of a convergence of cultural wealth. While the earliest inhabitants reached the Philippines on foot, the surrounding seas made imperative a tradition of boat craft. The Dumaga tribe fashioned the earliest boats. Hollowed from tree trunks, these vessels showed a high degree of workmanship. The Spaniards called the early Filipinos Negritos. However, they called themselves Lord of the Land to indicate the antiquity of their settlement. They still live in much the same manner as dwellers of the earth, touched little by history's civilizing hand.
The next wave of migration brought the seafaring founders, the Malays. They took over the lowlands and the river deltas, driving the Negritos to the hills. It is easy to conclude that they sailed from the nearby island of Borneo or farther inward from Indonesia. waves of migration from the different parts of Southeast Asia explains the diversity of Philippine languages. People living on one island, such as Luzon, speak no less than five major tongues, each unintelligible to one another. Tradition tells of the peaceful settlement or sail of the island of Panay. Ruled by King Marikudo, the island was ceded to Datu Puti, leader of the Malay immigrants for the price of a golden hat or salakot and some rare gems for his queen. These Malay forefathers were farmers. Their worship recognized the spirits of the earth and sky which in yearly cycle granted harvest from the patches of cleared forest and wilderness. Even in their primitive society, they have custom, ritual, and tradition. Their basic unit of society was the family, the large extended family who lived together in a settlement called Barangay, named after the boats in which they traveled to the Philippines from their ancestral homes. Each settlement was ruled by a datu. This title referred to a leader, not a king. In his territory, there were free men and slaves, but each barangay was a free and independent unit. Through time, the winds of change swept the islands. The threads of many cultures, the streams of a racial mix, entered into the making of the Philippines. The Sulu lands in the south became a racial melting pot as the growing trade in pearls attracted adventurers from all over the world. Ships from as far as China, Sumatra and Java came and created a trading crossroads in the south. Sailing trade routes to the east, the Chinese came in junks with goods for the commercial ports of the South Seas. As passengers and traveling merchants, they settled at various points in the archipelago to enrich the texture of national life as merchants and artisans. Intermarriage made permanent the various cultural influences brought about by foreign traders. Each new seed, each new cultural influence which touches ground on this soil, springs forth transformed as the Filipino makes it his own. Many aspects of Philippine culture carry the rich overlay of Chinese influence. Food, language, costume, even social thought and family system. Through the two Indonesian empires of Sri Vijaya and Majapahit, Indian cultural influence flowed to the Philippines. Hundreds of words are Sanskrit in origin. Arts and crafts and even folk literature reflect borrowings from Indian thought and cultural patterns. From as far as Arabia and Persia, the flow of racial and cultural influence continued to create a fusion to make Filipinos that inimitable mixture of races. Filipinos are an ancient people, but history fused its destiny with the West. On March 16, 1521, Ferdinand Magellan and his conquistadores 
brought Spanish Christendom and the roots of Western civilization. Three Spanish ships, sailing westward routes across the Pacific, raised the rugged coast of the island of Samar. Magellan promised the King of Spain that he would find a route past the great American continent to the famed riches of the Spice Islands. In this search, he drove his men through the overwhelming expanse of the Pacific. Through the long journey, they endured conspiracy, starvation, and disease. Raja Humabun, ruler of the bustling town of Cebu, received them with hospitality. Upon Magellan's urging, Humabun consented to be baptized a Christian and become a vassal of Charles, the King of Spain. Humabun himself had vassals of his own. One, the strong-willed and fearless Lapu-Lapu, chief of the island of Mactan. Because he refused to pay homage to the King of Spain, 60 Spanish soldiers set out to teach him a lesson. But the native warriors fought a brilliant battle, armed only with bamboo spears, primitive cutlasses, and bows and arrows, Lapu-Lapu and his men stood their ground against the steel-clad Spaniards. Fighting for their land and their people, they drove the invaders back to sea. This rash attempt at dominion cost Magellan his life. The defeat compelled the three Spanish ships to weigh anchor in hasty departure. Only one, the Victoria, continued to sail westward back to Spain and when they reached the harbor of Seville, they had gone full circle around the globe. These men, who journeyed to the Philippines, were also the first men to sail around the world. Three Spanish expeditions were sent to the east. Each one made its landfall in the Philippines. Villalobos, who led the third expedition to the islands, named them Las Filipinas in honor of the prince, who was soon to reign as Philip II. When Philip succeeded the Spanish throne, he decided to colonize the Philippines. The young conquistador, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, initiated the 400 years of Spanish rule with a conquest by the sword and the cross. As an outpost of the great Spanish empire, the Philippines became the seat of Christianity in the East. The Catholic faith is perhaps the most enduring achievement of Spanish rule, the conversion gave the people a distinct way of life. Festivals today are given form by an essentially religious spirit. In the province of Aklan, the religious feast of the town's patron, the Santo Niño, occasions the festival of Ati Atihan. The spirit, however, is one of pagan abandon, of ceaseless rhythmic music and dancing on the streets.
religion is more evident in the obvious solemnity of the Moriones, which reenacts episodes from the story of the redemption. This celebration takes place on Holy Week, preceding the Christian Easter liturgy. of Spain, the Philippines became embroiled in the Seven Years' War of 1762. With Great Britain's declaration of war against France and her allies, came the quick attack of British India against Manila. The British squadron entered Manila Bay and caught the city off guard. Defending forces fled across the Pasig River, and the invading troops pillaged and sacked the city in what was the first successful invasion after Spanish conquest. British rule and occupation in the Philippines was brief, lasting only two years. It was a minor episode in a great war in Europe, but it bore special significance for the history of the Philippines. The years 1521 to 1872 gave rise to the long line of heroes who began the arduous process of learning what it means to become a free nation. The men and women who blazed through their deeds and their thoughts and their writings the crucial questions that a people must face. In the northern provinces, Diego Silang seized the opportunity to free his people from the yoke of Spanish rule and without reference to the British, spread his rebellion through the countryside. When he died from an assassin's bullet, his wife Gabriela took over the struggle, but the strength of British troops soon overwhelmed the rebellion. The peace treaty which ended the Seven Years' War provided for the restoration of the Philippines to Spain. But the flame was lit. The national struggle for freedom and autonomy had begun. The liberal ideas of Europe's enlightened period gave shape to the growth of national consciousness. Slowly, Filipinos realized the common grievance which united regional groups into one, the common grievance of the subject people. The colonial experience which itself served to create one nation, one fatherland. The leaders of the revolution themselves, rugged individualists, fostered different paths for the struggle. The young warehouse worker Andres Bonifacio believed that the time was ripe for recourse to arms to right the wrongs suffered by his countrymen. To do this, he formed the Katipunan, a secret society which rallied together young recruits and the peasantry of Luzon to the cause of revolution. On August 26, 1896, he led the cry of revolt in Balintawak, which ended irrevocably the peaceful campaign for freedom. Others saw the same deteriorating situation but took an essentially reformist view. The propaganda movement, which they began as exiles in Spain, called for the introduction of reforms by the Spanish colonial government. José Rizal, who rose as the foremost Philippine national hero, called for a period of learning and discipline for his people, to learn to work together, to unify their means, their purposes, and their ends. He was convinced that the move to armed rebellion at that time was disastrous. Instead, he inspired his countrymen to the cause of education, that by means of instruction and hard work, they may acquire a personality of their own, worthy of the liberties they demanded. Condemned to death by Spanish authorities, Rizal was shot by a firing squad in Bagumbayan on December 30th, 1896. His execution sparked the people's resentment and the revolution spread like wildfire. On June 12, 1896, the Philippine Revolutionary Government under General Emilio Aguinaldo 
declared its independence from Spain in Cavit Cavite. For the first time, the Philippine national anthem was sung and the Philippine national flag unfurled. In a proclamation, Aguinaldo expressed his confidence that his people who had proven themselves so enduring and valiant in times of adversity cannot remain slaves forever. Such a people must be called to greatness, to take its own place at last in the great assembly of free nations. Meanwhile, across the Pacific, the Spanish-American War broke out. On May 1st, 1898, Commodore George Dewey destroyed the Spanish fleet anchored at Manila Bay. When the smoke of battle had cleared, Filipinos found only a change of masters. American victory laid the terms of the Treaty of Paris and Spain ceded the Philippines to the United States. For Filipinos, this intervention seized the freedom which was so close at hand. Filipinos refused to consider the Spanish session valid. In 1899, an assembly of Filipino leaders gathered in Malolos, a town outside of Manila, to write a constitution of the Philippine Republic. The document spoke well of their ideas for peaceful and orderly government. But the Republic was short-lived. In their battle against American soldiers, Filipino troops found they were no match for the formidable enemy. The Filipino-American War was a record of bitter defeat and in the end, painful surrender. But there were moments of glory for the men who laid their lives for the land. General Gregorio del Pilar at Tirad Pass and the guerrilla fighters in the unnamed foothills of war. Filipinos began once again a period of tutelage, now in the republican institutions of American democracy. The new colonial power expressed sympathy for national aspirations and made solemn commitment to grant independence as soon as the Filipino people could demonstrate their capability for stable government. The tidings McDuffie Act of 1934 provided for an election of a constitutional convention which would frame the constitution of the young republic. Complete independence would be granted in 1946. But the interim period gave the Philippines the status of commonwealth and self-government under Manuel L. Quezon as president. A charismatic leader, Quezon captured the love and adulation of his countrymen. His era was evocative of his fiery and flamboyant style. But it was a time of hard work and the Commonwealth leaders laid the groundwork on which would stand the future Republic of the Philippines. Providentially, these leaders gave first priority to national defense. Sooner than anyone thought, one more long ordeal was to begin. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on Sunday, December the 7th, 1941. That same day, Japanese planes bombed Clark Field north of Manila. Japanese troops landed in both northern and southern Luzon. The retreat of Filipino and American troops under the command of General Douglas MacArthur brought them to their last stand. Bataan and the island fortress of Corredor have become symbols for the bravery of both Filipinos and Americans who fought against the march of Japanese forces. The defense of Bataan and Corregidor upset the Japanese military operations in the Far East and halted Japan's thrust towards Australia. It was decided that President Quezon would leave the country to carry on the government in exile in the United States. On October 14th, 1943, 
José P. Laurel was appointed President of the Republic, inaugurated by the Japanese military organization. He faced the difficult and painful task of maintaining law and order. For the sake of the civilian population, he had to come to terms with the enemy occupation. Manila, as an occupied city, suffered destruction second only to that of Warsaw. All over the countryside, the cruel hand of war brought death and destruction. After a recurring illness, President Quezon died in the United States. In his message to the Filipino people, the new president, Sergio Osmeña Sr., praised the heroic resistance of his people. After the fall of Bataan and Corredor, the guerrillas continued to fight against the invaders. Without arms, hungry and unclothed, they gave battle to the enemy from every nook and corner of the land. On October 20th, 1944, American Liberation Forces landed in Leyte. General Douglas MacArthur fulfilled his historic promise to return. General Carlos Romulo, who later presided over the August Assembly of the United Nations, shared the peril and the pride of the occasion. MacArthur urged the Filipino people to draw on the indomitable spirit of Bataan and Corredor to renew their strength. For the tasks that lay before them, the Filipino people needed every ounce of will and determination. Liberation was at hand, but it was a time to rebuild on the ashes of war, to come together in the aftermath of so terrible a destruction. The process of rehabilitation might have been as much an ordeal as the long years of fighting. In the end, who could find the will and the strength to carry on the unfinished business of nation building? The long and painful quest for national sovereignty ended in the morning of July 4th, 1946. Over the ruins of a war-torn land, the Filipino people raised their flag, brave symbol of an independent republic of the Philippines. The return of peace, fragile as it was, marked the return of festivals. The celebration and merrymaking provided easy diversion for an essentially gay and happy people. The festivals of flowers in the summer month of May is a celebration of youth and beauty. It is a celebration of the Filipina, idealized by a religious tradition of the shy and sheltered maiden, guarded by the strict norms of church and society. But festivity could not disguise the urgent need for social renewal. Two decades of freedom and self-rule proved too short to rid the young nation of the plague of corruption, of desperate economic problems, of social ills in the city, and agrarian injustice in the countryside. The arrogant power of the entrenched elite, drug addiction, senseless violence, the breaking down of order in public life, crippled any move for progress. Soon, the angry face of discontent took to the streets. It was difficult to know what the people feared more the violence of protest, or the sense of defeat that anything would change. On September 21st, 1972, President Ferdinand E. Marcos proclaimed martial law. With Proclamation 1081, he began the work of building a new society. This decree was a promise an earnest for the future, a monument to the revolution that transforms and directs for the ultimate freedom of man. On this occasion, the president spoke. Change was at the heart of this program, edifying, liberating change. For the stark realities which continually confront man in a lifetime do compel change. A process of unceasing and irresistible 
flux is the rhythm of human life. Contemporary experience confirms the historical record of renewal, which is added upon every civilization, including our own in Asia. The comforts and the settled habits of time have had to be swept away by the onslaught of change, so that life itself might continue. Necessity makes its own fulfillment. In this way, man has been able to survive the forces of nature and refine his capacity for upliftment. This was every Filipino's dream, a dream of a reformed society. That dream must now become reality. The revolution must begin in the form of individual commitment, in the change of heart of a renewed and vigorous society. A society characterized by a new sense of order and discipline. A society fired with an enthusiasm for work, giving new vitality to commerce and the building of industry, governed by a spirit of trust and goodwill. This vision creates a new world and a new beginning, a solemn pledge to the country's youth for their world tomorrow. Today, the Filipino must look ahead, for he faces yet the greatest challenge. In this time and place, the Filipino must once again prove himself to live truly in the service of his country and his fellow men. The new Filipino comes forth imbued with the responsibility and a deep sense of commitment to his tasks. The protection of natural resources, the care of our cities, the fight against poverty and disease, the tilling of the soil for richer harvests, building the youth for a better and stronger tomorrow. In these tasks, his strength lies in his history, the proud history which on this occasion he recalls and presents to the world. This then, is the story of a people's mighty struggle to be free, to build on this land a home worthy of the dignity of man. My God.